This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on ethics and professional standards and the reading on ethics and trust in the investment profession. I have lots to say about ethics and lots to say about trust, but let me begin by telling you how blessed I am to have been raised by two wonderful parents. My father was pretty much a rules-based parent. He taught me that there was a correct procedure and a correct way to are you ready for this? Do the dishes, cut the grass, practice basketball, treat my two sisters, uh, have respect for my coaches and teachers. My mother, on the other hand, was pretty much a principles-based parent, and she would offer me the following advice. She would say, you know, Jimmy, I caution you before you are judgmental about your friend's behavior to think about how they feel. Go ahead and uh, walk some time in their shoes. And so I was raised in this combination of a principles-based and a rules-based parenting model. Now, what we'll learn here is that the CFA Institute is uh, pretty much a principles-based kind of a model. Now, the trust element here in the title of this chapter, I want to go ahead and share with you, and maybe you learned a little bit about this, although you're probably not as old as I am. Uh, back in the 80s, I learned a little bit about trust from President Ronald Reagan when he had that famous quote, trust but verify when he was dealing, uh, when he was dealing with Russia. I say that to my children all the time, trust but verify. They, uh, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, look at these learning outcome statements, and I'm sure hoping that you had wonderful parents like, like I did. And essentially, uh, these LOSs are saying to us as good financial analysts that, you know what, your behavior is reflective not only upon yourself, but your colleagues and then externally. Remember in one of those recent uh, recordings, we used the word landscape. I think it was in that uh, FinTech uh, reading. And that's what we're doing here. We're once again, scanning the environment, scanning the landscape, and remembering that we're just a small part of this entire landscape. And so we owe it to the CFA Institute to be responsible to ourselves and of course our family and our parents, but also to our colleagues and our clients and to everybody out there that the roots of our profession uh, grows toward. So I'm not sure any one of these LOSs is more important than the other one. You know, when I get to a group of these, I always go back to what I learned in the very beginning of my exposure to the program in that the CFA Institute uh, pretty much has said, look, if there's an LOS, then that LOS can show up on the exam. These are kind of general LOSs here, and I think we'll kind of cover those in, in a general sense in this reading. Now, remember, this reading is one of a handful of readings on ethics and the code, and so we'll get into super, super details in future recordings, but, but not so much today explain ethics. Boy, I think I just uh, did that with my example of my mom and dad. And by the way, you know, my mom and dad have been gone for a while. And once you guys uh, earned the right to use the CFA designation, the CFA Institute is not going to go away like my parents do, but their, their influence is supposed to impact us on a daily basis. I mean, I think of my parents, of course, uh, of course, every day. And so I think of them. Let me read some of these uh, bolded words to you. Ethics, a set of moral principles, rules of conduct, guidance, a belief that guides the actions. And so this is really kind of an inward way of thinking. You know, what do I want to be as a good financial analyst? And then, of course, we've got to go and look externally. So we need to maintain the public's trust in financial markets. And so it's about this time in our conversation where you can go ahead and scratch your head and say, well, Jim, I can think of hundreds. I don't know if there are thousands out there, but surely hundreds of examples where uh, investment professionals have failed in the delivery of maintaining that public trust. 
however, I'll go back to the old uh, the old comment that I learned in uh, in grade school. One bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch. Wasn't that an Osmond song? There's your homework assignment. Go listen to Donny Osmond sing that song from 1970 something. Uh, look down at the very bottom. Code of ethics is a written set of principles. All right, this is what I was talking about with my dad. And, and what these principles do is serve as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior. All right, so it's one thing to have this belief, right? I want to be an ethical financial analyst. But then we need to make sure that our behavior reflects, uh, reflects our belief. So notice that. Notice that very last one down there serves as a general guide of how community members should act. So once again, there's that principles-based uh, kind of an idea. Now, standards of conduct are explicit standards or rules that give specific behaviors required of community members. All right, so it serves as a benchmark explaining the code of ethics. Ah, members agree, usually in writing. And, uh, you know, every year when I renew my membership, and you, you guys will do this uh, uh, after you pass level one, right? You'll have to go in and uh, answer a series of questions. Six documented principles, and we'll go ahead and uh, look at those in super detail in future slide decks. Not, not too much today. All right, so here we go. Here are these uh here are these six right act with integrity competence diligence respect and in an ethical manner boy these are really really super questions so you can imagine a question stem where there's an individual who fails to act in any of these uh, types of behavior I tell my children this all the time. You either have integrity or you don't. You either uh, show integrity in small uh, examples, which will lead you to show integrity in, in large examples. I always think of uh, a lack of integrity uh, as someone who sneaks around. You know, how many times did I sneak into the cookie jar when it was before dinner? And then my mother was super smart and she would say something like, you know what? I counted those chocolate chip cookies and there were nine of them and now there's only four in there. And I would have to say, you know what, mom? I didn't have integrity when, uh, when, I, when I decided to eat those cookies. Competence, boy, this is probably what we spend most of our time uh, looking at here in, the, in level one. And we'll do this, of course, in level two and level three, competence. Being able to address a problem, being able to quantify all of the inputs and outputs of that problem, and then, and then to manage that problem. So competence, that's super important. Diligence, we all have that capacity, right? Diligence just means to put on our work gloves, get out the shovel, and dig. And we dig and dig and dig. Diligence means hard work. Respect is super important. Not only self-respect, not just self-respect, uh, inside of our office space, or you know, now we're doing Zoom space, but respect between and among all of our colleagues and between and among and interdependent with all of the markets that are out there. So look at all these stakeholders. And I, I can't imagine the Institute wouldn't uh, throw an exam question at you that relates to public clients, prospective clients, employers, employees, colleagues, and other participants in the global capital markets. This is what I was talking about earlier about uh, scanning the environment. What was that word we used? Landscaping. Uh, the second one here, this is what my mother was trying to teach me. You know, uh, before you're judgmental, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. So yes, of course, let's go ahead and make certain that we place the interests of our clients and the interests of the investment profession above uh, our own personal interests. Now look, there's a huge temptation out there because these capital markets and their interaction with all of the financial analysts generally produces uh, lots of compensation out there. And so there's this temptation to, to search for that compensation, but the CFA Institute wants us to put that over here and say something like, look, if you act with integrity and competence and all those things, 
and you place your client and the profession's interest above your own personal interest, then of course that compensation is going to follow. That's almost like a sidebar. Shouldn't be your focus, although it's tough. It's tough not to focus on that, but that will be kind of a side effect. Yeah, reasonable care. We're not going to get out our shovel and dig 50 feet down and once we hit a rock, you know, just try to keep digging and digging. I mean, sooner or later, we're going to have to say, you know, I've done enough. So reasonable care, independent professional judgment. That's a super important one. Independent means that we have no personal biases and we're not influenced by uh, the external environment. Now, this fourth one here, I, I was... Uh, I was curious about it when I first started reading about uh, about this code, you know, 20 years or so ago when I went through the program. Practice and encourage others to practice in a professional and ethical manner. So not only are we responsible for our own behavior, but we're responsible for all of our colleagues' behavior, whether or not, whether or not they hold the CFA designation. There's another uh, use of the word integrity. Uh, I love that word. Uh, viability of global capital markets for the ultimate benefit of society. Because look, what, what are we doing here? We are experts in this field, which of course it comes out, you know, finance and investments comes out of economics. And so what are we trying to do? We're trying to evaluate these fixed resources that we have, let's just say on earth, and we're trying to allocate those resources to their most efficient and optimal use. You know, it doesn't make any sense that if I dig in my backyard and I find a big old pot of gold in there, it doesn't make any sense for me to bring that pot of gold and put it down in my basement and say, boy, I have that pot of gold down there. Isn't that cool? No, what, what I want to do is I want to try to figure out what's the best use of that pot of gold. I mean, it might be to turn it into the gold bars that uh, James Bond used in several movies. It might be to turn it into a wedding ring like this thing right here. It might be that I can use that as collateral to go trade on a derivative market or, or, or. And so that's what we're doing here to, um, uh, uh, to um, promote the viability of global capital markets for the benefit of society. Maintain and improve their professional competence. I'll go ahead and be super honest with you guys. Putting together these uh, recordings and making these presentations to you guys is a tremendous help for my uh, improvement and my professional competence. And of course, I'm a voracious reader and I encourage you guys to. You've heard me say this many times in other recordings. Read the Wall Street Journal every day. And when you're done reading that, go read something else improve professional competence. You always learn something new uh, virtually, virtually uh, every day. I'll tell you just a super silly story. I had, I had a student one, one day, this was a graduate student, this is years ago, came to me and said, hey, uh, you know what? I have a collection of Barbie dolls that my grandmother gave me every year for my birthday when I was a little girl. And my grandmother gave me these Barbie dolls in their cases. And I opened them up and she, my grandmother said, I love you. And she took the she took the Barbie dolls away and put it in her attic. And this, uh, when my student said, I, I felt so sad that my grandmother gave me a present. But then years later, her grandmother passed away. There are all these Barbie dolls in pristine condition. And she ended up selling a handful of them on eBay for thousands of dollars. And so this is what I learned. This is improved professional competence that a Barbie doll might be a great investment as part of a well-diversified portfolio for some clients. All right, here are these seven standards of professional conduct. I'll go ahead and read through these just quickly. Remember, there's an entire reading and uh, we'll put together a, a recording for you on, on all of these uh, sometime in the near future. So professionalism, you know, what does that mean? For me, as a sports fan, it's easy for me to think of 
think of professional athletes and how they carry themselves. Some are more professional than others. Uh, one of my longtime heroes, and of course I'm, I'm dating myself here, is, uh, is a defensive lineman for the Minnesota Vikings, a guy named Alan Page, who, who was a great football player. And then he uh, went to law school and, uh, and became a judge. And he might still even be a judge somewhere in Minnesota. And so he carries himself as one of those like super professionals. And so when you see Alan Page walk into a room, you look at him and you think, hey, you know what? Uh, uh, that's somebody who I would like to emulate professionalism. Integrity of capital markets. I mentioned that before. How about duties to clients and employers? And so you got to make sure that we balance both of these two standards. So we owe lots to our clients, right? We need to make sure that we put their interest ahead of ours. And then we work for somebody. Now, I know some of us are independent contractors, but, you know, sooner or later, we have to answer to somebody who pays us. So we'll talk at length about duties to clients and employers. Now, I love this fifth one here, investment analysis, recommendations and actions. And so uh, what we're talking about here is almost everything that we've done so far in the level one of the CFA program. Analysis of equity securities and fixed income securities and derivative securities and alternative investments like like my Barbie doll example. And then we process all of that information and we have this idea. We say something like, oh yeah, Mattel, which makes Barbie dolls, we think they're overvalued or undervalued or fairly valued. And then, and then we take an action and that action, and once again, I want to go ahead and tie this back to the policy statement. That action, it might be that Barbie dolls are appropriate for six of our clients and inappropriate for 94 of our clients. And so those actions there then link back to professionalism, integrity, duties, and duties, of course. So that's important. Conflicts of interest. I think these are about the most interesting set of questions that the Institute can ask because we're always faced with a conflict of interest, whether it's between the client and the employer, whether it's being between the client and the capital market or the client and ourselves or, or, or there are these conflicts of interest and uh, these are interesting from a question writing standpoint because they go back to the way my my mother would have raised me principles based rather than the way my father raised me as in rules based because boy these are general ideas and it's difficult to have a set of rules that will capture every instant uh, every instance and every scenario that we might come up against and then there are responsibilities as a member or a candidate. And of course, if I'm writing these CFA Institute questions, you guys are CFA candidates. So I'm probably going to write one that says something like, all right, as a candidate, what are you, uh, what are some principles that you should adhere to? Now, a couple of slides here on how to establish trust. All right, so what are some bolded words up there? Specialized knowledge. Oh man, now you may think that specialized knowledge, that doesn't sound like anything that we've been doing in level one because level one goes like this, right? There's tremendous breadth and the Institute wants us to know about quantitative methods. They want us to know about micro and macroeconomics. They want us to know about asset allocation and equities and fixed income and derivative, right? We have, so that's there. And then we have to go like this for all of that depth. But I promise you, and I'm guessing that uh, most of you know the answer to this one here, is that once you move forward in your career, you'll go ahead and forget about a whole bunch of those things and maybe not forget is uh, is the right way to characterize it but they'll become less and less important in in your daily professional life uh, emphasis on continuing education we talked about that and focusing on the needs of the client that's super important as we move through uh, these readings all right so how professions uh, establish trust. All right, so a service to society. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about finding these fixed resources, 
right, these scarce resources and moving them to their most efficient output. And we're going to do that by behaving in a certain way. Of course, what was that earlier slide? We're going to use some ethical standards. Maybe we'll throw some morality in there. Maybe we'll throw, you know, some other kinds of thought processes into uh, our beliefs and our behavior. Normalize practitioner behavior. Ha, ah, boy, look at that last part there. Hence, gaining support from regulatory bodies and governments. Oh, boy, this sounds really cool. So what are we doing? We're, we're this group of people here, and what we're doing is we're acting in the best way that we can, right? We're not the one bad apple that I talked about earlier. We're the shining, the shining bright red honey crisp apples that when you bite into it, there's so much juice. It's almost like eating a steak. And so government bodies and regulatory agencies out there, they look at us as a profession and they say, boy, I want to be a part of that honey crisp apple. Client focus, we said this here, best interests of the client. What does that mean? Reasonable care, reasonable uh, skill, reasonable diligence. Uh, professions have a high entry standard. So this is important. What's the entry standard for uh, being able to use the CFA designation? Well, you have to pass three tests and you have to have some experience. And for those of you who are watching me, you have to put up with me in these 30 or 45 or 60 minute, uh, 60 minute videos. Of course, that's not, that's not part of the entry standard. Uh, monitor professional conduct, right? Of course, we can, the CFA Institute can say something like, you know, here are these sets of principles and we encourage you to behave in this way. And if you violate any of those principles, well, then nothing will happen. Of course, there has to be consequences there. And so that's the held accountable that's in bolded there. Respect for each other. Yes, go back to, uh, go back to what my mother used to teach me. All right, this code of ethics communicates shared principles and expected behavior. And so I'm guessing that as you're looking through uh, this reading and then the following and subsequent readings on ethics and the code, you're probably saying something like, you know what, this, this makes sense. And if I wanna be a part of this community, then I'm gonna have to adopt these principles and this is going to be my behavior. Now I'm guessing for most of us, it's not like we're going to have to change from a bad apple in the bottom of the barrel to a nice shiny red honey crisp apple. But what the CFA Institute wants us to be aware of is let's fine tune all of what we've learned from our parents and our siblings and our uh, uh, us fellow students when we were in grade school and in high school and in college and you know we learn a lot from all of the people uh, that we've come in contact to uh, come in contact with during during our whole life my father used to say something that was r really kind of uh, uh, humble in his own kind of way he, he would say to me in his last years he would say you know son I've I I've taught you how to be in many things, but I've also taught you how not to be. <laughs> uh, once again, viability of global capital markets for the ultimate benefit of society. And there we go. Uh, here's, here's the sentence here. Principle-based standards. Shared principles of honesty, integrity, transparency, diligence, and placing clients' interests first. All right, so I'm pretty sure that we've already uh, described and answered this question, high ethical standards. Why are they so important? Well, I, I guess you could go to the financing of all of this. What did I say earlier? This efficient allocation of scarce resources that is in the oh, trillions of dollars. I don't even know what comes next. Quadrillions of dollars quintillions of dollars. I don't know, it's some massive amount that I really can't get my, my head around. But what happens is that you've got all of this capital moving simultaneously between and among markets. And, uh, you know, here we are. Here we are. How many of us hold the CFA designation? I think I saw some data recently that there were, there've been about three and a half million individuals who've taken the exams and about half of those people 
uh, have passed. So, you know, and now some of those people passed in 1970 or whatever it was, you know, so you have a relatively small group of people in, in this, uh, in this CFA community. All right. High standards prevent a market collapse. You know, you got to have to go ahead and shake your head and say, what is, a, let's define a market collapse. But here's the thing, because we have these high standards, I'm going to repeat that because we have these high standards, comma, even in the face of the 1987 stock market crash, the 2000 dot com crash, the 2008 financial crisis, the 2020 COVID collapse, even though we have those crises. And of course, you guys know just as well as I do stock prices fall, bond prices fall, derivative prices fall, if, if they're meant to fall in, in that direction. But what happens? These high standards allow us to recover. That's the super important point about having these high standards. It's great having high standards when stock prices and bond prices are soaring. Right. But the true test is those high standards are going to help recovery. And that's why we have that third uh, right angle point built upon trust, the investment industry. And then the last one here, there's uh, there's reputation. So, of course, unethical behavior can cost you your job, reputation and professional stature. Uh, go ahead and do a quick search right now while you're watching this, while I switch to the next slide, type in Ivan Boski and uh, look at a picture of him when he emerges from uh, serving his prison sentence. You know, this is all the way back in, uh, I don't know, right around the time I got married. Now, one of the interesting things is that even though uh, investment management has been around during your lifetime, probably, uh, and my lifetime, you know, it's still not too, it wasn't too old when I was born in 1961. You know, it's a relatively new profession, which means that not only are we as financial analysts learning, what was that earlier slide? Improving our competence and uh, our skill set, et cetera, et cetera. The public is still understanding our practice and codes. All right, so what, what do we need to do? We need to make certain that part of our strategy is to let everybody know out there that, hey, you know, we operate uh, according to these codes. Those of you who are golf fans, when you watch uh, golf tournaments, especially, you know, on Sundays when it's the last round of the golf tournament, and I hardly ever watch commercials, but you watch commercials for these wealth management firms. And there's one uh, particularly uh, relevant commercial that's come up, uh, you know, after COVID and after high inflation, where there's a gentleman who's probably about my age and he's sitting with uh, his wealth manager and he says something like, you know, where am I now? What is COVID? What is inflation? What has that done to my plans for retirement? And the wealth manager looks across the table and she says to him, well, wait a minute, look, we've talked about this for the last decade. We knew that something like this could happen. We have a plan in place and, and here's what we're going to do. And she says something like, you know, we're about four or six months behind where we wanted to be, you know, a couple of years ago. So we're going to have to make these adjustments. And so I'm thinking to myself, boy, this is really a cool commercial because what it does is it illustrates all the stuff that we're talking about here. Boy, what have I said to you in many, many recordings before? Risk management, identify the risks, which of course she did. <laughs> quantify the risk, which of course she did. And now this commercial is her outcome of managing these risks by putting the client first. All right, so what do we have? Licensing or certification, right? I have students all the time who want to take their series uh, exams, whether it's, you know, seven or in the 60s or whatever it is. I've had students who do this. And so, of course, you have to study and you have to pass this test. Um, one of the key elements of getting a license or a certification is to be aware of, let's go back to that word that I used earlier, landscaping, right? So we need to scan the external environment, which includes not just, you know, things right here in front of me, but, 
you know, all throughout the globe. Did you guys see recently that the uh, some telescope was launched out there and now they're finding pictures of the universe when it was uh, first created? I have no idea how they do that kind of stuff. But my thought was something like, boy, this is true scanning the environment. If we could take that telescope, is it called the Hubble telescope still? And, and beam the lens back to Earth to see exactly what this investment management industry looks like and, uh, and where it's going to go. How about challenges to ethical behavior? This has everything to do with our reading on uh, behavioral finance. And so this particular reading mentions a couple of things here. Overconfidence, boy, if we're overconfident, then we're bound, we're bound to have more faith in our decision-making than being able to be influenced by others out there. So what we need to do is make certain that well, what were some of those things? You know, we needed to uh, have competence. We needed to have diligence. We needed to have integrity. We need to have all those kinds of behavioral characteristics. But what we want to avoid is thinking too highly of ourselves. And then over on the right hand side, we need to make sure that we don't think too highly of those people over there because we can be influenced by you know, kind of uh, herd mentality. Oh, if everybody over here is saying that Tom Brady is going to win another Super Bowl, well, then I'm going to go ahead and make decisions according to Tom Brady winning, uh, winning another Super Bowl. So these are kind of two ends and two consequences of, of not having the trust in our own decision making and not having too much trust in our own decision making. Yeah, this is a really cool and simple illustration. There's legal stuff over here. There's ethical stuff over here. Sometimes they meet, some, sometimes they, they, they don't. And so we can go back to that, um, you know, kind of an historical example where some countries, some countries say things like, hey, you know what, if you have uh, material, private information, go ahead, by all means, go ahead and trade on it. And we don't care how much money that you make on that trade because you'll influence prices and sooner or later, they'll, uh, they'll, uh, those prices will find their uh, true value. Now, of course, some countries say, well, now when you're trading, then that you have an unfair advantage. And so we're going to make that illegal. So, you know, it's possible that some legal procedures uh, are not considered ethical. And then there are others where ethical practice may, may not be legal. And there's a whistleblower example there. All right, how about if we look at this, one of these final uh, LOSs, describe and, imply a, and apply a framework. All right, so ethical decision making, what does that mean? So far, we've spoken pretty much in generality. So we have this well-developed set of principles when making decisions that can affect, you know, lots and lots of other people. And so what we need to do is we need to make certain that those principles lead us to the appropriate ethical decision. Now, these ethical decision frameworks, they can exist in all sorts of varying forms, depending on what path we are. I mean, you know, think about going to work for if our career is, is with a, uh, you know, financial institution here in the United States, we might be a wealth manager, we might be in charge of retail banking, we might be in charge of uh, derivative trading. I mean, you know, so these ethical decision frameworks are probably unique to each silo inside of a business. But here's where I think it gets even more interesting for this LOS. Um, Notice down the left-hand column, this is super uh, similar to what I've been saying. What did I say? Identify risks, quantify risks, and manage the risks. Well, here, these are broken into four kind of categories rather than three. So this framework is four. So how do we identify? We collect relevant facts. I mean, that makes perfect sense. We try to figure out who are the stakeholders and what kind of obligations do we owe each one of those stakeholders? And then how do we go and find those ethical principles that apply to each situation? 
And then we need to try to identify any conflicts of interest. For many, for many of our ethical decision makes, uh, I'm sorry, for many of our ethical decisions, there might not be a conflict of interest. And so it's important for us to say, hey, um, I don't think there's a conflict here. All right, so what do we need to consider? Situational influences and behavioral biases. This is what I was saying just, uh, just a few moments ago. And then additional guidance. So what did I say earlier? So identify risk, uh, quantify risk. So, so in this framework here, the Institute is saying, let, let's consider this. And so inside of the situational influence and behavioral bias, we're going to try to quantify them. I mean, maybe we can't do it mathematically, but we can do it at least on a scale. And then look at that additional guidance. I mean, this is super important for us, right? So we have uh, policies and procedures or the CFA Institute code and standards. So here's this managing risk part that I was saying earlier. You know, here's where we go ahead and make the decision. And then we go ahead and announce that decision and we inform all of the stakeholders about our decision. And then we spend some time trying to figure out, all right, did we make the right decision? Reflect and assess your decision. Uh, this is one of the really cool things that I was privileged to be the son of my father, who was a basketball coach. And after uh, after basketball games, uh, he would go through, hey, you know what? These were all the great things you did during the game. And you see these four things that you did. Boy, uh, you really need to improve. Uh, on those four areas. And over time, over time, those four areas became three areas and then two areas and then and then however many, however many areas. So I had my father teaching me there. We had the Institute plus we have all of our colleagues. You know, what did it, what did we have on one of those earlier slides? Something about let's go ahead and promote ethical behavior between and among all of our colleagues. And so, boy, it's awesome for a colleague to come to us and say something like, hey, you know what, Jim? You, you made this decision for this particular client. I liked all these things, but this is how I would have done it differently over here. And you know, so you gather all this information. It's kind of like putting us all on a springboard so that we can jump up and jump up and jump up. If we're out there by ourselves, you know, we might just belly flop. Yeah, so notice we have that uh, vertical arrow going up and down. The ethical decision-making process is iterative. This is kind of like mathematical equivalence of going back and figuring out what the IRR is of some kind of an investment project. You know, we're lucky we just whip out our financial calculator and hit the IRR button. But the calculator inside of that computation is is guessing and guessing again and guessing again. It's iterating and iterating. Is that a word? Uh, if it's not, it ought to be. And so what we're doing is we are constantly, constantly learning. And that takes us through these LOSs. Let me go ahead and just remind you that this reading is really just kind of a general sense of what comes next. So it's important to know all of these LOSs so that we can apply them when we get into more specifics. So thank you for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying.